Shalom again. Now I continue part two of my sharing of on the subject of from Delta to Thelipsis. It's all about what lies beyond the current pestilence of COVID-19 and the latest deadly variant called Delta or Delta Plus. So what in God's timetable is next on the agenda. That's very important for all Christians everywhere to address and to understand. Now we've been talking about a very important subject, persecution, affliction. Why must these things be so? Why must Christians suffer? We give a variety of reasons from scriptures, Basically, the curses of Yahweh because we violate His commandments, the sins of our forefathers, that's right, and some are born blind or crippled, that Yahweh may be glorified in a subsequent healing. And uh, people born with physical defects like Mongoloid children, but yet <clears throat> they are created in His image to glorify Him. And therefore, we should not take matters into our own hands and dismiss, abort such children and so on. And then the question about the curse that Yahweh took upon Himself refers to the curse of eternal damnation there's some healing <coughs> available <coughs> for us, but we should not be presumptuous to uh, imagine or to teach and uh, to expect that God will heal every sickness that we have. And uh, presumptuousness is a problem with many Christians everywhere. And when the healing does not take place, their faith will also fail. So we are to take the whole counsel of Yahweh. Let, next, let me uh, <coughs> lead on or go on to another very important aspect of why Christians must suffer or why Christians do suffer. And it's something which most pastors do not preach about. And that is that we are expected to be partakers of the sufferings of our Savior, Yeshua, partakers of Christ's sufferings. Let me <coughs> refer to a number of verses. Turn first to the first letter of Peter in chapter 4, reading from verses 12 to 14. Beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened in, unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Then turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and the children then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. A third source from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul declares, That I may know him <clears throat> and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, that if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. 
Note the following points. Being a follower of Christ and having the Holy Spirit attracts persecution. That's right. <clears throat> you might remember the vision of Paul or the encounter of Paul with Yeshua on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts chapter 9, where Paul was struck down from his horse and a voice spoke down, spoke to him, Paul, why, why do you persecute me? From there we learn that when Christians are persecuted, the person being really persecuted is Yeshua, is Christ himself. Okay? When you persecute the body of Christ, you're persecuting the head, Christ himself. Now, from the verses I read out, <clears throat> especially from uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, this note, very important point, that suffering with Christ is part of the qualification that we need to become joined as with Christ and to be glorified with Him. You know, because of false teachings, I've, I've shown you in so many videos before, that people, Christians, are taught to expect glorification, to expect heaven, to expect entrance into the kingdom without any suffering, without dying to their flesh, without walking closely with the Holy Spirit. That is a perversion of true doctrine. And you expect to be richly rewarded in heaven without going through suffering. Because through false doctrines, Christians are taught to expect glory in this earth, in this world, to be able to bind and pass out whatever they don't like around them so that they can have a happy, prosperous life in this world, free of diseases, free of calamities of all kinds. The, the sad thing is that or the reality of Scripture is totally different. If you want to be heirs and join heirs with Christ, you must expect to suffer with Him. Suffering qualifies us to be joined as with Christ. Suffering prepares us for glory. And Paul himself, Paul himself, the great apostle to the Gentiles, said, He sought the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. That's part of trying to know him and eventually to experience his resurrection. Just as Christ said to suffer and die before his glorious resurrection, we have to suffer, we have to die in the flesh before our glorious resurrection. Like master, like servants, like master, like followers. Are you a follower of Christ? Are you sure you want to walk in his footsteps? You want his glory, but you don't want the fellowship of his sufferings. You want his glory, but without death upon the cross. And for us, it's death to the self-life, death to the carnal life, death to the fleshly nature. That by the power of the Spirit, we should put to death the deeds of the flesh. Put to death the old man of sin. Let the new man reign in our lives. Are you doing that? Will you end up partaking of his glory if you despise the suffering, if you despise the death of the cross, the need to die on your own cross, to carry your own cross? That's right. Expected of us. Yahweh's ways are mysterious, but they bring forth wonderful fruits. The powers of darkness never understood the cross. They thought, Satan thought, by killing Yeshua on the cross, end of the matter. 
it was the beginning of a glorious future. The beginning of the end for Satan himself, that he himself will be destroyed forever in the bottomless pit, to suffer forever and ever, together with those who follow after him and his horrible ways. The Christian life and walk is not a wide and easy way. The gate is not wide and easy. We we'll show you very shortly. It's narrow and difficult. And look at Colossians 1.24. Paul talks about himself. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. <clears throat> now, of course, Paul is not blasphemous to think that uh, Christ's sacrifice was not complete. He was simply saying that as the member of the body of Christ, he also needed to suffer, to have a fellowship of Christ's suffering, as I explained <clears throat> earlier. Not as part of our redemptive uh, process that's accomplished by the cross of Yeshua, but it's a process of dying to ourselves to put to death the old man of sin. That involves some suffering, some sacrifice. Okay. The next important point, the head Yeshua suffered. What do you think the body can expect? And here I quote you the very words of our Savior Yeshua in the Gospel of John in chapter 15, verses 18 to 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So the key reason actually why Christians face persecution, adversity, suffering, is because people, the devil, see Christ in us our hope of glory. You see, the Holy Spirit in us, that in itself attracts the lightning of their unwanted attention, the distress that they can bring upon us, the persecution, even unto death, because we follow in our Master's footsteps, because we remind people of our Master. You see, my, my dear friends in Christ, if you are really faithful to Yeshua, following after our Master in His footsteps, leading a life of obedience, walking in humility before Him and before men, people will see something of Christ in you. And when you see something of Christ in you, those who are going, going to um, eternal glory eventually will be attracted. You'll be a light unto the world. But to those who are perishing, you and I become objects of disgust, objects of oppression, objects of persecution and affliction because they hate Yahshua. And when they see Yahshua in us, they hate us on account of Yahshua. So that's a very powerful reason why Christians get persecuted. It's a powerful reason why when the Antichrist appears, if you refuse to submit to his mark on your forehand or your forehead, but you proclaim allegiance, adherence to Christ, he will take off your head, chop off your head. So the next important point in line with what I've been sharing is that suffering is critical is important, indispensable for the development of what the Bible calls patience and character. 
patience and character. You might want to refer to the book of Romans, chapter 5. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. You know the Greek word dokime, D-O-K-I-M-E, which the King James translates as experience. It's actually better translated as character, as Paul says, as character. So suffering, suffering, tribulation, enable us to develop patience, long-suffering, as a fruit of the Spirit, and through long-suffering, character. What kind of character? The character of Christ. Look at a very important verse in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, which explains the, uh, the mission of Paul, the calling of Paul the Apostle. My little children, whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Till Christ be formed in you. That's right. Until we bear the image and likeness of our Savior, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never ever forget that. That's what the salvation process is all about. You see, my friends, many, many uh, preachers call themselves evangelists. They spend their life sharing the gospel. Now, nothing wrong with that. But <clears throat> look at Paul. Paul was first and foremost an evangelist to the Gentile world. He brought many to Christ. But he didn't stop there. He spent many years going back to the same places where he uh, had these people converted and baptized. He went back and spent years teaching them teaching them, teaching them the Bible, biblical truths, by example and by precept. Towards what purpose? He says, I labor, I travail. The word travail is I labor like a pregnant woman till Christ be birthed in you, till Christ be formed in you. That's right. This is our real mission. Not merely in getting people to so-called accept Christ, but really to live the life of Christ so that you and I, our followers, will bear His image and likeness, not our image and likeness. See, the problem of many discipleship programs is people try to make disciples do exactly what they themselves were doing and behaving. Now, they get it wrong if they themselves are not walking right with their way. Listen to the words of Paul himself. He says to his followers, imitate me even as I imitate Christ. So in other words, what you see in me that is of Christ, follow after. And likewise, what you see in me that's not of Christ, don't follow after. So there are two things. That before we try to disciple others, are we ourselves faithful disciples of Christ? Do our lives reflect the life of Christ? Have we got the character of Christ? Do we remind people of his image and likeness? Are we conformed to his image? If so, we can help people to be like him. But watch your shortcomings, watch your sins that are not dealt with, watch the defects of character that are still uncorrected by him, you have to be careful. 
you don't want to develop followers that are in your image and likeness and not in the image and likeness of Christ. So this is a very important point. Now, on the part of the followers, we are to look at our leaders in the light of the Bible, in the light of the scriptures, whether what they preach is true, proven in scriptures, their lifestyle, whether it reflects Christ correctly. We, of course, should not end up being judgmental and critical, but we should not be tolerant of deviant behavior, behavior that's scandalous to Christ and other followers. You, you can see responsibility of the preacher, of the teacher, of the pastor, and of the followers. Both, both have to find the model, the anchor in Christ. Both need the Holy Spirit to guide. Both need the scriptures to verify a doctrines. But is there still a role for the preacher, the teacher? Yes. We still need to bring forth the word as faithfully as we can. But as followers, be like the Berean church. Check everything out for yourself. And I say to you, please take my notes, take my videos, use pen and paper, raise questions. Tell me things which you cannot agree with. Tell me verses which contradict what I say. I am open to correction. I'm telling you this. I want to stand corrected in his sight. I walk in the fear of him, in reverence of him. I want to uphold his word as faithfully as I can. And above all, I want to project the life of Christ despite my failures, despite my failings. Please forgive me for the shortcomings that you see in me. And please pray for me that I too will bear his image and likeness. Okay. Praise be to our Father Yahweh. Praise to Him. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our guide, our counselor. We need you. We need you to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, to comprehend your word, to understand what you're saying, to pay the price of follow, being followers of Christ to suffer that we may have his character, his likeness. Let me give you a third quote from Helen Keller, the deaf and blind pianist and author. Quote, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. You can see that the soul is strengthened through trial and suffering. There's inspiration for ambition and the success that comes when Yahweh empowers us. And note another very important point, which again, too many preachers ignore in their sharing. And that's the importance of chastening by our Father Yahweh, the chastening that produces sonship. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, <clears throat> God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Imagine, if you go out to the streets tomorrow and you find an orphan boy, 12, 13 years old, dirty, filthy habits, cursing, smoking, drinking, drug addicted, and you want to adopt such a person as your son, you bring to your home. First thing he does is, he put his feet up on the dining table 
He smokes in your presence. He doesn't take showers. He's thinking. He grabs whatever food he likes. He doesn't leave anything good for the rest of you. What do you do with such, such a person you bring to your house? Are you proud to call such a person your son? What must you do? You must gradually teach, chastise, discipline, and shape him into what you want him to be, the kind of man that you want him to be, that be worthy to be called your son. And then you will happily adopt such a person. Well, the bad news is we are like that before Father Yahweh, when we first come to him through Christ. Dirty, filthy, horrible habits, sinful habits, full of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, full of pride in our lives. That's right. Very worldly. Gradually, we need to be transformed into his image and likeness. What does he have to do to, besides teaching, discipling by whom he appoints over us? He, might, he would have to send adversity our way, chastisement, to be sickness, distress, calamities of some kind, in order to bring us to our knees, in order to open our eyes of understanding. A chastening of Yahweh produces sonship. My friends, to be a worthy son of Yahweh is not an instantaneous process. I've told you many times that different Greek words which are used all the way from an infant to a toddler to a teenager and to a grown son and mature son of God. Different Greek words that denotes different stages of development in the Christian life. Where exactly are you in your Christian life and walk? Are you ready to be adopted as his mature son, his mature daughter? It's a question that you need to address to yourself. And I hope that you find my videos helpful to challenge you that you too may desire to be transformed into his image and likeness and you too will submit to whatever chastening he sends your way. Have you ever felt the hot breath of displeasure by Father Yahweh? Have you ever felt as though he was caning you on the back of your spine? I have. I have. For sins that he wanted me to overcome. For long time habits that I needed to overcome. That's right. I could literally feel the lashes on my back. I could literally feel the pain of his chastisement. And for many people, the chastisement can come in terms of losing thousands and hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars of their money because of the hot displeasure of Father Yahweh. Greed must be dealt with. Covetousness must be dealt with. Lust must be dealt with. Everything must be dealt with. That's right. It's not instantaneous. Salvation is not instantaneous. The salvation of the soul is a lifelong process. Your mind, your, your will, your emotions, all have to be brought to subjection to Christ. Think about it. Have you brought every thought unto, cap unto captivity to Christ? Do you have the mind of Christ as Paul asks us? That we are to have the mind of Christ? Do you have the mind of Christ? Is your heart still full of deception? Is your ambition still very worldly? Have you reigned in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh? What about the vanity, it's the pride of life? How many times you feel hurt easily? Do you know I tell people that I counsel, if you can still feel the hurt, the pride is still there. The ego is still there. The old man of sin is still very much alive. Until you can behave like a door mat for everybody to trot upon without complaining, and you have arrived. Are you a door mat for Christ? You know what a door mat is? Think again. Now let me turn to 
<clears throat> the next stage beyond pestilences and earthquakes, the tribulation. <clears throat> Here we're going to make a distinction between the tribulation period and the period of the great tribulation. So again, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 7 and 9. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So note the word sorrows is translated from the Greek word odin, O-D-I-N, which actually should be better trans translated as birth pangs, birth pangs. And the word afflicted comes from the Greek word ellipsis, which is also translated as tribulation, persecution, in addition to affliction. Tribulation, persecution, affliction. So think of the birth pangs, the Odin, getting more frequent and getting more severe in terms of painfulness. And think of the afflictions, the persecutions, the tribulation that is coming very shortly. Again, Matthew's Gospel 24, turn to verses 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, <coughs> but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And I said unto him, Sir, and this is Romans, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, from these two verses, it appears that there's a difference between the tribulation period and the great tribulation. The tribulation period is generally recognized to be the last seven years. Daniel's 70th week also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the last seven years before Yahshua's second open coming. Turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So notice the one week, the one week of seven years, and then in the middle of the week, exactly three and a half years, comes the abomination of desolation. Okay, now I'll say a bit more very shortly. All right, so you have the seven years, the beginning of the tribulation, halfway you have the abomination of desolation, and from there is the period the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. In Matthew 24 passage we read earlier, Yeshua was talking in the context of when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, then those in Jerusalem should flee. Okay, so that is the that is the signal for the last three and a half years period called the Great Tribulation. The beginning of the seven year period covers the seventh year or until the end of the seven year is the whole period is called the tribulation period. Turn again to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. At that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book, the time of trouble. Jeremiah, or Yemiah, chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. For thus says Yahweh, who heard a voice of trembling, 
of fear and not of peace. Ask you now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? All their faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for the day is great, so that none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So, time of Jacob's trouble is the last seven years. It's Daniel's 70th week. It is a week, the beginning of which the Antichrist will confirm a peace treaty with Israel and other nations. And that's just round the corner. So, in Matthew 24, verse 17, Yeshua referred to the tribulation when the birth pangs get intensified. The great tribulation period refers to the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Yeshua used the term megas thelipsis. Megas is for great. Eh? Mega in Greek. We have the same English word, mega. Mega, something very giant, gigantic. So mega thelipsis, great tribulation, refers to the period immediately following the abomination of desolation, the holy place, the desecration of the altar at the temple in Jerusalem by the Antichrist. And his, history has a precedent, Antiochus Epiphanes, sacrificed a pig on the altar. There was a first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, but there's another one to come very shortly. And turn to uh, <coughs> Luke <coughs> chapter 21 verses 34 to 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Yeshua instructed his hearers, his listeners, to pray that we may escape the great tribulation of <coughs> the last three years. <coughs> By the way, if you read the book of Revelation about the last three and a half years, particularly when the seventh seal is opened and the seven trumpet judgments are revealed, followed by seven bold judgments, there are two parts to the tribulation, the great tribulation. One is a judgment, a terrible, horrendous judgment sent by Yahweh upon the earth, upon men, upon mankind. The other is a tremendous persecution of Christians by the Antichrist. At the half point mark, the three and a half point, three and a half year point mark, he will demand to be worshipped as God in a temple statue of him being put up there, he will demand his mark to be placed on your forehead, upon your, upon your forehead, for you to make any kind of living. But the words of scripture remind us, whoever takes his mark will be condemned, will be damned forever by Yahweh. No possibility of salvation for anybody who takes the mark of the beast. At a future occasion, perhaps we will have time to discuss what this mark of the beast is all about. That you may know in case you are still around. My hope is that we all get raptured before even the beginning of the seven years, the last seven years, before the Antichrist appears, or maybe shortly after he appears, we all want to be raptured. So, but there are conditions for the rapture. Look at my video on rapture soon. And you'll find various scenarios of the rapture. All right. Now, there's something else in Scripture that, that you may find um, that you may not like. And preachers, actually, I never hear any preacher refer to it. You look at the verses in Paul's letter to Philippians, chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. And in nothing, terrified by your adversaries, which to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God, 
for unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Wow. So many preachers preach the calling. Oh, I got a calling as evangelist. Some profess to be apostle and prophet and teacher and so on and pastor. They pride themselves on the calling. But they never tell you that we are called, that everyone is called to suffer in addition to believing in him, in accepting Christ, in trying to walk after him. You are called to suffer for his sake. Now, it's mind-boggling. How do we comprehend this? Is this for real? And if I were to preach this openly, would there be anybody who wants to come to Christ at all? And that's why Christians, that's why pastors don't like to preach such verses. I told you more than once before, I am the preacher of inconvenient verses. I go where other preachers dare not go. I once was sharing some important doctrines of the Bible to a pastor from a mainline church at a lunch. He listened very carefully. At the end of it, he looked at me and he says, Dr. Tan, you are right. But you know, if I were to preach what you preach, what you teach, I will lose most of my members and I will be out of a job. So very sadly, he turned away and continued preaching his false doctrines. The fear of man was greater than the fear of Yahweh. He knew the truth, but he did not dare to preach the truth. You will notice that over the years, I mean, if you've been around me for, for some time, that I had big followings at the beginning, and the numbers began to dwindle and dwindle. The closer I preached the truth, the more the numbers dwindle. It's to be expected. Why? When the way is wide and easy, the gate is wide, the queues are long. When the way is narrow and difficult, the queues are short, very short. So we are called to suffer. What a calling. You see, want to stay with Christ? Because being in Christ like attracts the lightning from Satan. On the world, attracts persecution. Suffering, perhaps untold suffering, even unto death. Are you prepared? Will you accept suffering as your Lord as a Christian? And what Paul is saying in Philippians is quite astounding. He says that suffering for Christ is a token evidence of our salvation. Wow. Wow. So if you are a worldly Christian, would the world persecute you? Answer would be no, because you'll be compromising. That's right. You look at you look at the couple that making wedding cakes, refused to make for a gay couple, got hauled up before the court, even all the way onto the Supreme Court. Okay. The pastors who refuse to perform gay marriages, likewise get hauled up before the courts and so on. So what it's all about? So if you stand up for the truth, you will be persecuted. Because the truth represents Christ. He says, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So you dare to preach the truth? You might end up in jail. Look at the American churches today. More and more, the freedoms are being taken away. That's right. Next important point. Those who cause the suffering of real Christians because of our faith in Christ are actually manifesting their own impending perdition. There's evidence, there's token 
that they are slated for perdition. That's right. Of course, there's still the mercy of Yahweh. Remember, Paul was a persecutor of the Christians. He consented unto their deaths. Okay? Attended quite a few stoning of Christians to death. But yet, Yahweh had mercy upon him. And he got converted and became the greatest apostle, one of the greatest apostles that ever lived and preached. So, those who cause the suffering of Christians are actually manifesting their impending perdition. And Yahweh, Yahshua himself, warned us to expect tribulation. Again, the Gospel of John, this time, chapter 16. John 16, verse 33. These things are spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have so. In the world you shall have tribulation. There's no way of escape allowed for the Christian as a follower of Christ. Next is something again preachers do not refer to, but should actually preach. Namely, the suffering of Christ is necessary for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Suffering for Christ is necessary for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. I refer you to Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The entrance is beset with much tribulation. I find confirmation in another important set of verses. Remember what Yeshua said about a white gate and a white easy road, a narrow gate and a difficult road, that the second one will lead to life. I quote Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter ye at the straight gate, for white is the gate, broad is the way. That leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now, you just look at these two verses. It should actually scare you into submission to Yahweh, scare you into walking closely with the Holy Spirit. Why? He says, there are two ways, two gates. You can choose the white one, the easy way. Many people will find it if referring to Christians. The narrow gate, the difficult gate, few are those who find it. And if you check the corresponding verses in Luke's uh, Gospel, when Yeshua was asked, Master, therefore, is it true I paraphrase, that few are going to be saved. And he kept quiet. That few are going to be saved. So few are those who find this narrow gate, this difficult path. Now let's look at the, um, at the, the, the word, the narrow, <coughs> in verse 14. It's actually the Greek word, thlibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. And Tiblo is can be translated as afflict, narrow, suffer tribulation, trouble. So listen. Matthew 7:14 is better rendered, translated as because narrow is the gate, constricted is the gate, and the way that leads to life is beset by affliction, tribulation. And few are they that find it. So imagine 
we are facing a gate that is very narrow. So if you are too fat, you probably cannot enter it. Too much baggage, you cannot enter into it. Then the road that leads up to it is full of affliction, tribulation. The path is uneven, full of potholes. Very dangerous road. People can take shots at you. They can hammer you. They can do violence to you, set you on fire, and so on. It's a way of affliction, tribulation. So it's a trial of faith that leads to the salvation of the soul. And this is what Peter said. First Peter, chapter 1. Verses 6 to 9. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness to manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perish, perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom Having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not, you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Look at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, the culmination of your faith, the goal, the ultimate goal of your faith, the salvation of the soul. This is one of the few places in Scripture where the salvation of the soul is laid out so explicitly, so starkly, to never believe those false preachers which tell you, once saved, always saved. You made a decision for Christ, you've been baptized in water, you, you have it made already, you got a passport to the kingdom. No, don't believe any of them. Salvation is a threefold thing. We are spirit and soul and body. The spirit has transformed born from above, a new heart, a new spirit that can see something of the kingdom. But beyond seeing something of the kingdom, you could be trained to enter the kingdom, except you be born of water and the Holy Spirit, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just being born from above to see, but it must be born of water and the spirit to enter the kingdom. The ultimate goal is to enter kingdom. So what does the water speak of? It's the water, the water of the word. In Ephesians chapter 5, we are told that Yahshua is preparing his bride to make it spotless, blameless, by the washing of water by the word. So as we read the word of scriptures, begin to walk in obedience, begin to allow the transformation of our lives to conform to the words of scriptures to become, to conform to the image and likeness of Christ, our soul is being gradually transformed. The mind, the emotions, the will, everything submitted to Christ. So the end of our faith, the ultimate goal of our faith is the salvation of our soul. That's why at the moment of death, don't think that your soul just goes to sleep as some false preachers have taught. No, the soul goes immediately to judgment. It's appointed once to a man to die. And after that, the judgment, this comes on the book of Hebrews, appointed once to a man to die. After that, the judgment. We'll look at my videos on the uh, judgment seats and thrones. Judgment seats and thrones. Parts 1 and 2. Very important video. Study very carefully for yourself. It is going to be a very frightening experience standing before our judge after, immediately after death. And the soul will either be admitted to heaven or sent out to hell straight away. And if you're heaven, you'll be brought down by Christ at the rapture. Your body is resurrected to meet the soul, reunited and brought to heaven. That's the rapture. That's the first resurrection. So if you miss out on the first resurrection, you will have to wait for the second resurrection. You'll be resurrected under uh, unto condemnation. Resurrected, given a new body, 
and then plunge into the lake of fire. So, you have the spirit born from above, you have the soul transformed gradually over your lifetime into the image and likeness of Christ, salvation of soul, and if your soul is saved, then your body will be saved. There will be two resurrections. Don't miss out on the first resurrection. That depends on the condition of your soul. Take the words of Scripture seriously. Check out these videos carefully for yourself. Check these verses for yourself. Don't just trust what I'm telling you. Check it out. Your salvation depends upon the veracity of the word of Yahweh, His promises. And look at what's going to happen to a lot of Christians. Remember the parable of the sower, right? Some fell on the wayside, some fell on stony ground, some fell on a little bit of soil, and some fell on good and rich soil. Four different categories. Only the last one will bear fruit 30-fold, 100-fold to the glory of God. The first one, on the pavement, the birds of the air will pick it up and take it away. The moment you hear, it goes out the other side. Second, stony ground. You get excited when you hear the word of God, but because your heart is stony, the seed, the seed cannot sprout properly and grow properly. And therefore, you lose your faith. So Mark chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 explains, and these are they likewise who are sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive with gladness, have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward. When affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Immediately they will leave Christ. So that's a second type of ground on which the seed is sown. But there's a third one, which I didn't mention here, but you should refer to immediately following verse 17 of Mark chapter 4. You will find the third type of ground. There's some, some shallow soil. So there's some growth. But when the sun comes out, it will die because the roots do not go deep enough. So there's no fruitfulness. But the cares of this world will overwhelm the good seed that is sown in our lives. So my friends, the preacher of inconvenient verses have given you many inconveniences, inconvenient verses to read, to study, and to ponder about. Will anybody leave the assembly because of the preaching? I leave everything in the hands of Father Yahweh. Will those who watch my videos agree or disagree, like or dislike? I leave it in the hands of Father Yahweh. On the day of judgment, not I, not even Yahshua, but the Word will be your judge will be my judge on the day of judgment. Take heed, my friends. Shalom. And may you make it on the way of affliction through the narrow gate. May we be among the few that find ultimate salvation, find glory in the presence of our Father Yahweh. To be joined us with Christ, to partake of His glory, because now we're willing to partake of His sufferings. Shalom again.